never been told how to actually process difficult, painful emotions. The men can go in the wilderness and scream and like tap their chests. And what about women? Oh yeah, yeah, no, that didn't affect me when you actually picked somebody else after I was working so hard. Yeah, no, that didn't. Actually, it did. And I'm a resentful bitch. As we are on our self-love journey today, we're going to talk about embracing all the different aspects of ourself. And as they call me the queen of emotions, <laughs> I've literally devoted my life to this work because there was a time where I did not really allow myself to feel. How many? Pretty much everyone in the room. <laughs> Great, you're my people. And so we're gonna really dive into this and we're gonna embrace all of those different emotions because I want to start by just honoring this queen who I love so much. And she says, I've learned two things about pain. First, I can feel everything and survive. And second, I can use pain to become. And for those of you who have been following my journey for a very long time, you know this is literally what I kind of live by. In every single aspect of my life. And I feel like everyone of you here, because you have been a coach and you signed up to be a coach because you have had to go through some pain, right? And maybe being here over the next two days, you're gonna go even deeper into that. Because just like in my life, I've now fueled it and used it for it to actually lead and be my dharma, my purpose. So much so that I actually wrote a book about all of that. <laughs> How many of you have a copy of that book or have read it? And so my dreams came true earlier this year. And for those of you who recognize one of those pictures, that was me up on the stage last year talking about that suck now what. And the reason why, I mean, this book was so special. This was my fourth book, but it was my very first one with a traditional publisher. And how many of you have written books or want to write a book one day? Okay, pretty much everyone in this room. So my book writing journey was literally the linchpin. It was the catalyst. It was what launched my coaching speaking career about seven years ago. So when I landed this book deal, it was huge. And when I'm talking huge, I literally was in the hospital giving birth to my second daughter. <laughs> this is the truth. And my agent calls me and he says, Nitha. And I'm like, yeah, literally my legs are in stirrups. And I'm just like, you sure it is your agent? Yeah, yeah, okay, we, we've been waiting for this call. Because I was rejected by 20 different publishers before that day. And so to get the call at the same time that I'm birthing my daughter, I was like, I, okay, I've got, I can't, I can't miss that. <laughs> and so it was such a huge deal because it was also my favorite publisher. It was Hay House. And so I wanted to actually make Hay House proud, right? And so I said, like, okay, I'm gonna create a vision board of what ideally I would want this book project to look like. 
So I wrote down some of my dreams and my goals, and I said, okay, best-selling book. Okay, award-winning book. And then I'm like, nope, cross that out, cross that out. And I wrote New York Times bestseller, right? Right? Okay, for those of you who are not in the States, New York Times is kind of a big deal. And so, I mean, I wrote to all of my friends to help me promote this book. I wrote to even people that I admired so much. I even got Jay Shetty to endorse my book. I did all of the things. I had asked my mentors that I looked up to for so many years to ask them, well, what's that journey like of becoming a New York Times bestseller? Like, what do you have to do? What do you have to feel? What do you have to be willing to do to put yourself out there to get rejected? And so, I did all of those things. I did the 200 podcasts. I sacrificed many sleepless nights to be away from my family and my young baby to go on these interviews. I was on NBC and I did all of these news things and my ego was like, more, give me more. <laughs> Because the little Nita, who was seven years old, had just kind of had a taste of winning her first trophy at the piano lessons, right? The piano competition. Then at 10 years old, it was dance competition. And then at 11, it was the math competition, because I'm half Indian. So we're soul fam here, right? I can be real with you, I can be honest. I mean, I'm from Chicago, so we're gonna get a little honest. I kinda got competitive, <laughs> honestly. And so I'm like, okay, we're gonna do all of the things. And I'm just like, okay, babe, yeah, whatever. We're gonna, we're gonna support this. This is your dream, this is your vision, and we're gonna go all out. And so it even made it to the New York Times billboard. And when my book launched on January 31st, I called my agent and I said, okay, do we have news yet? What's the news? Did we make it? We made it. And he's like, Nita, he's this New Yorker guy. Think Larry David, if you've ever watched Curb Your Enthusiasm. Older New Yorker guy. And he was like, Nita, you're brilliant. You're amazing. It's definitely gonna make the New York Times. Absolutely, you keep on going. And I'm like, okay, all right. Okay, I think we're there. I think, we're, I think we're obviously there. And then I get the email, and it said, week of February 7th, because they announced it a week later, or a week and a half later. And my name was not on that list. This is the first time I'm sharing that story on stage, by the way, with all of you. And that really hurt. And then I went into this pity party of one, for those of you who have read my book. <laughs> Why me? What the heck? I did so many interviews. I left my kids, I worked nights, I worked days. I did all of the things that everybody was saying you should do. So I called my agent frantically and I said, they made a mistake, right? They made a mistake. And he's like, yeah, Anita, we had high hopes for you. <laughs> but you, you just, you didn't make it. And I said, but I think there were other people on that list that sold less books than us, right? He's like, yeah, doesn't matter. New York Times doesn't work that way. <sighs> My husband comes home that day and he said, babe, did we hear the news? And this was when my rage <laughs> and my anger would boil up to the surface because I'm a recovering people pleaser. And so then as soon as he walked in the room and he said, babe, and I said, don't you even dare. He's like, what happened? 
Should I be supportive right now? Do you need to vent? Do you want me to fix? In true coaching fashion, right? <laughs> I said, I don't even want to talk about it. And I said, we didn't make it, but guess who did? And I was angry and I was livid. And I literally was pacing around back and forth. I'm like, I can't believe it. I did all of those things. I can't believe it. I, I followed every single tactical playbook that I was supposed to. And boy, did my ego get the best of me, didn't it? Truthfully, I had to sit in my own suck. And my husband that night, because we kind of joke, he said, babe, is it too soon? Too soon to say, that sucked, now what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a little too soon. It was a little too soon. So I had to be reminded of why I actually wrote the book in the first place. Because how many of us get so carried away by the accolades, by the shiny objects, by all of the things? I mean, you all are in the several different certifications, right? And then what this person says and that person says that we get so hooked up and caught up that we forget our heart. We forget. And I had to be reminded, so I checked my DMs. And literally, does this work? <laughs> okay, I'll do it this way, this way. <laughs> this one. I prioritized everyone and I abandoned myself. I've since left my abusive relationship. And then the one in the middle, oops. This guy wrote an acronym for my name, Neeta, N-E-E-T-A. Navigate every emotion towards acceptance. And that landed. I'm like, wow. Okay, thank you, universe. And I needed to actually feel every aspect of those feels. And this was during my book launch. And I took that time because there's literally no playbook, right, on how we're supposed to feel pain, on how we're supposed to process that pain. Because what does society tell us? Keep going, you're resilient, right? That's what I was told. I've literally made it most of my career path, writing books on resilience. I had to teach myself the medicine that I was teaching others in this book, right? There's no playbook on feeling the feels in grieving and sadness because what does society want us to do? Suppress those emotions, squash it down, right? Because we're all living in our heads. We're not really fully feeling. And I had to do a lot of that. I did not want to grieve and feel sad about what that actually took me to into my little girl of feeling abandoned at 10 years old when my mother was going through a double mastectomy. And I was with my great grandmother who didn't speak English. She only spoke the Galog. And I thought everyone left me. And then at 13, when I try to sit with a new group of girls at school, and they looked at me like, rejected again. But I realized we have to feel in order to heal. Because what happens then, right? When we suppress, bury, and deny, well, unhealthy coping mechanisms. How many of you had or are or have been a toxic positivity person? Everything's fine, everything's fine. 
oh yeah, did you, how did the book do? Oh yeah, it was great. It was, it was great. Yeah, I'm okay. It's like every ad in the 1950s, right? Where it was like Mad Men and then you see the women just like, yeah, okay. And the, the food's supposed to be done, the kids are like behaved. Where is the room for us to fully emo, right? And then you all are coaches. And how are we supposed to hold other people's pain if we can't even hold our own? If we are just logically thinking about it and, oh, there's a tool for this and there's another tool for that. Those are all great. But how do we actually, like, where does it land in our body? That's what I want to get to today with all of you. Because otherwise, we're going to have a lot of those human moments where we burst and dump on others. Who's guilty of that? Hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better tool to actually integrate the really tough emotions and the ones that we judge ourselves for. I used to judge myself for feeling angry, for feeling rageful. Because what are the memes that we see on Instagram about a woman losing her SHIT? You guys know. What are they called? Yeah, okay, yeah, I got. Okay, that's one. <laughs> but she's crazy. She's crazy. Oh my goodness. Because we've never been told how to actually process difficult, painful emotions. The men can go in the wilderness and scream and like tap their chests. And what about women? Oh yeah, yeah, no, that didn't affect me when you actually picked somebody else after I was working so hard. <laughs> yeah, no, that didn't, actually it did. And I'm a resentful bitch. <laughs> right? And then we attract other people who are kind of toxic in our life, who's meant to teach us about our patterns and our emotions. Maybe they're toxic in our partnerships or in our friendships or maybe in our families. And we tolerate them because we don't know how to protect ourselves. So our journey today, we are going to reflect on the parts of ourselves that maybe we tend to suppress we're gonna go on a journey of maybe even exploring our inner child. For some of you, inner teen. And then by the end of this, we are going to integrate it. We're gonna do some partner exercises. And I wanna make sure that by the end of this, for day one for you all, that you walk away embracing all the different parts of you we game? Okay. All right, let's do this. So who was little Nita? All right, well, at seven years old, I wanted to paint. I would literally come home every day from school, and paint and draw. And I love drawing these elaborate, well, I thought they were elaborate. They probably weren't. <laughs> but they were flowers in the sun, and it didn't really matter because it actually made me feel really happy and joyful, right? And then Nita, 10 years old, had her grow up really fast because her mom got sick. And then Anita at 14 and 15 and 16 and 18 and 19 would go through tremendous loss, losing three members of her immediate family, my mom, my brother, and my dad. And so that little Anita that you see 
was a caretaker, had to suppress all of the sadness and grief because, boy, it was too painful to feel. And everyone on the outside told her, you're strong, Nita. You're resilient. So I had this really tough armor all around me. And, ooh, I did not want to break. No, no. God forbid anybody see me cry. Does that resonate? So much so that when I became a mom first to my son, I suffered severe postpartum depression because there was so much anger and rage that was bubbling up to the surface. Like the pressure valve was like opened up and it was coming through. That I hadn't met or allowed that 14 year old girl who was angry that her mom was dying. The 16 year old girl that lost her brother, just like that. I had to suppress all that rage. And so it came up to my partners. It came up to my in-laws because I, for the first time in my life, had to surrender to having other people take care of me, right? To surrender to be mothered. And so now, literally looking at a mini version of me every day, Isla is that reminder. But even if you don't have kids, we can all connect to that person, that little boy or girl that maybe just wants to play, that little boy or girl that didn't really take life so seriously. So I just want to ask, and maybe if we can get mic runners just handy, that would be great. What were you told as a child? Let's scream them out, shout them out. I'll give you something to cry about. Let's keep it going. Who else? Okay, you're, too much. you're too much. You're too loud. Don't go to you Say that one more time. Don't talk if no one's asking you anything. Children should be seen and not heard. Yes, that's, I'm getting to that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so true. You're too sensitive, yes. You can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Don't cry. Oh, that's a big one. Oh. Men don't cry. You were a mistake. Oh. Oh. Stop dreaming and study. That was mine. <laughs> Be realistic. Your dreams are too much. Are you sure you can do that? What's wrong with you? Why are you so crazy? Stop craving attention. Stop craving attention. You're not gonna make it. Oh, you're not going to make it. Why are you wasting time? Why are you wasting time? Girls, Girls don't whistle. Yes, time to grow up. Don't oh. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Yes. If if you, if you would have been the first one, there would never have been a second or third one. Oh, wow. Oh, can we just breathe that in for a second? Oh. All right, let's explore our inner child. Okay, let's, let's get up. Let's get up. And did you know that kids giggle about 300 times a day. And as adults, 
As grown adults, we only laugh, not giggle, laugh 12 times a day. That is crazy, right? All right, so you're gonna turn to a partner. Just look at somebody. I'm gonna set my timer for 10 seconds. And we are going to, and I want you to put your hand on your belly or your womb, whatever we want to go, call it, and you are going to belly laugh for 10 seconds looking at each other. Let's go. Amazing. We needed that release, right? Why is it that we need permission for us to giggle? How, how did that feel? Do we feel lighter? Releasing all of that trauma from the past? <laughs> and loves, you can all do this with your clients. That takes 10 seconds. That is an easy grounding practice that you can do just to get us out of our heads and fully into our bodies. Especially for those of us who think, 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 overthink, overthink, overanalyze, and you're gonna have a lot of these clients as well. So let's explore that inner child of ours, shall we? I want you to take a moment to just connect with your heart. Put your hand over your heart. You don't need to take a photo of this. I'm gonna lead you into a little visualization of meeting yourself. Can I get the meditation music, please? So go ahead and close your eyes. Maybe look down. And just bring up that time when you were maybe five or six or seven. Who were you? Who did you need to be for your family? Did you feel heard? Did you feel supported? Did you feel seen? Were there any gender obligations? Did you have to grow up early? Were you compared to your cousins, the other kids in your neighborhood? Were you allowed to share your voice? Or were you taught to obey and suppress? When were you told you were too much or your dreams were too big? innocence of that seven-year-old that lives within you. Where in your life did now that seven-year-old 
suppress other areas of your life where you chose to dim your light where you chose not to share where you chose to just fit in fly under the radar go ahead and give your inner child a hug and acknowledge all of the gifts that they have for you and maybe in this season right now they have a message for you maybe it's to play bigger maybe it's to laugh more it's just to remember how much fun you used to have doing all of the things that you wanted and now you just take it so seriously when you are ready go ahead and give yourself a hug just embrace yourself this is all about self-love today. Feel your heart. Feel where that tension is. Take a deep breath. <sighs> and let it go. Yeah, let's do that one more time. Oh, yeah. And when you are ready, I want you to wiggle your toes and welcome back to the room Ooh. so people can only meet you right as deeply as they've met themselves and this goes for you and your clients that you are going to serve and I always think all of the challenges and all of the setbacks and all of the experiences, right? When we reach a certain level, when we reach that next level, there's going to be other obstacles and other elements, other setbacks that's going to remind us where are we maybe abandoning ourselves? Where are we abandoning the little child that's still in us, and now we know better. So, where in your life as a coach, ooh, I just sound really a lot better now, thanks guys, uh, have you suppressed yourself? People pleased, allowed no boundaries. And before I have you reflect, I would just love to take a couple of shares. What came up for you? If we have mic runners in that meditation and where you see yourself as a coach, maybe doing some of these things because you weren't allowed to be heard or understood. Anyone wanna share? Right over here, yeah. We'll take two. Um, that was beautiful, thank you, Nita. I just wanted to say what I got from it was when you said you dim your light to fit in and fly under the radar. That really resonated with me because I got dropped into a lot of different creches, kindergartens and schools as my family traveled the world. And so I was always like, a new language, new people, always trying to fit in mm -hmm. and just sort of navigating these new circumstances. Yeah. And I'm still carrying that with me, this idea that I have to sort of kind of not be myself, yeah. but actually kind of calibrate myself to the group and the culture instead of standing up and just allowing myself to, to shine. And that takes real courage. So thank you for allowing me to tune in with that. Mm.
takes me a lot of courage to stand up here and share that. <laughs> because the truth is, is that when I come to a group like this, I do it again, you know? Yeah. I'm, I come to the group and I go, oh, how am I gonna fit into this group now? So I actually want these two days to be about me not trying to fit in and just to be, <laughs> you know. Oh, I love that. Thank you. We've got one right here in the center. I'll just share your name. Hi, Nita. I'm Jen from Canada. Hi, Jen. I want to thank you so much because everything you mentioned in your story, I really relate to it and it's really nice the way you show up and you, you help people with that. And one of the things of your list is when you suppress yourself. Uh, back in 2017, I was like really in big pain of like condition of arthritis and everything and I was not even in Mind Valley yet. And I decided one night it was too much and I decided to write a letter. It was my, my younger self telling me, when did you suppress me? When did you stop having fun, you know, and shining and everything? We had fun and now you're looking everywhere else to get this approval, but we have everything, you know, we, you don't need that, like who we already are. So I don't know where it like came from or something, but that was like just my little self literally telling me, hey, go back, you know, come back here and just have fun and do it. So, and then that was the year I find Mind Valley and I, I get in, so thank you. Yay. Thank you. All. And you're here. Yeah. And now. Woo. So, so I want to get to one more exercise before I take any more shares, but thank you. And this leads me to your reflection question. I want you to take this for today. I want you to screenshot it. Because as these two amazing women have just shared, where do you actually tend to diminish yourself? And specifically, what emotions do you tend to suppress or bury or are ashamed of? And where else do you bury it in your life and your business? And even today and when we navigate into tomorrow, this is going to be the hallmark because you all are learning how to hold space for the bigness of other people's emotions, right? And if you're okay with your emotional agility, you're allowing people to have that vulnerability with you and they see it in your energy, they see it in your essence. And as Ajit was saying, the energy in this room is fire today. So let's tune into that. But before I let you go, my time's almost up. I want to allow you to have your own temper tantrum. Is that cool? Kind of like how I had my own. And Ajit was like, do you want me to fix? Do you want me to just, do you want me to give you advice? Do you just want me to witness you? Right? So I want you to do this for your partner. Like these lovely little guppies of mine remind me to do that every day. And you'll recognize this. I don't know, my slide got a little funky there. But you'll recognize this because this, this is one of the main practices in my book. And I'm gonna simplify it even further because what I really want you to do and some of you, how many of you have not literally had a temper tantrum or allowed yourself to or judged yourself and have chosen to bypass your emotions to actually say, no, I'm fine, I can do better, I'm gonna try again next time. Yeah, okay, all right, this is for all of you in the room. So we're gonna get emo for 60 seconds. You are gonna look at the person right next to you and I'm gonna give you, we're not gonna do it for 90, but we're gonna do it for 60 seconds where you are going to be, partner one is going to actually be with the shortest hair, 
and recall that sucky moment. So they're gonna go first. And they are going to say, I was really angry that I didn't get the promotion. I was so frustrated when I got rejected, when I wasn't picked. Maybe you can't even go into your inner child. And I want you to tantrum and move and shake and scream. Because guess what? All of the feelings that we're so afraid of experiencing, all it takes is 60 to 90 seconds. And this is a fact. Behavioral scientists have already stated that. 60 to 90 seconds to feel any emotion. So we got 60 seconds, right? Yes? Partner two, the one with the longer hair, you're gonna be like Ajit. You're going to be present. You're going to allow. You are not gonna say any words. You are just going to witness them. Partner one, you're gonna know how that feels. And I'm gonna play one of my rage musical songs that I love. Ready? So turn to your partner. Partner one with the short hair is going first. Let's play that dinosaur dance. Here we go. 60 seconds. Have your temper tantrum. Let me see you. Like a dinosaur. Like a dinosaur. Scream. Let it out. Dance. Shake. Tap. Ah. Let me see you. a seat. And I just want to hear from a couple of people, how did it feel? All right, let's get settled in. Go ahead and have a seat. Let's go back to our chairs. I know we want to meet and mingle since we released a lot. Was this the first time for any of you? to have a temper tantrum like this. Okay, for a lot of you. Okay, for our first timers actually fully embodying that, how was that? Amazing, right? If we do more of this, this is our emotional hygiene. I was a dentist in my past life, so I'm liking anything hygiene, you know? And emotional hygiene is way better than emotional dumping, right? And how long was that? That was 60 seconds. And how do you feel? And can we actually allow for our partners to also ask, do you need to be supported right now? 
do you need to scream and yell and I just witness? For how many of you was that the first time to actually witness someone without saying, oh my God, I have to fix it. Can I stop you right now? Ah, this emotions are too big for me. Oh my God, I have to shut you up. Who was feeling uncomfortable with that? A few of you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we liberated everyone. Because <laughs> these are the tools we get to practice. And these are the juicy morsels that you all get to take away in your practices. And that's what lights me up. I don't care about that New York Times or whatever. Neither should any of you. And so here are some tips I'm going to leave you with. You get to be the guide for your clients. No judgment at all. It's a no judgment zone. But guess what? When you judge yourself, that's when we get stuck. And you can start to mirror with your clients. You can use a timer. We can feel anything and release it in 60 to 90 seconds. And we obviously don't have to live in our head. So, what is that last part of yourself that you are accepting just a little bit more today? And before I leave, I would love to close, if that's okay, with a poem from Rumi. And because we're all soul fam, I would love for you to read along with. This is a shortened version, by the way. This, being human, is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you so much.